Good morning and welcome to this week's programme, which is an anthology from the archives for Mother's Day. This morning, Pauline Buick, how her mother decided to give her a Kerry childhood. Shay Healy apologising to his siblings for being his mother's pet. Frank McCourt on his indebtedness to his mother when growing up in poverty in Limerick. Survivors of children's orphanages recall their mother's ordeals and Sister Hildegard with a nun's perspective on how Irish society treated what they insisted on calling unmarried mothers. With songs from John McCormack, Paul Robeson and Al Josen. Painter Pauline Buick was born in England but has lived in Ireland most of her life and is an established Irish painter. And in this 75th birthday interview, she talked to Miriam O'Callaghan about her indebtedness to her mother. My mother was walking through a wheat field in England. <laughs> As you do. And a tall blonde man walks towards her and she felt something was going to happen here. And uh, he said, is there a house for sale? And my mother said, uh, yes, actually, there is. I can show you. Come back to our house and I'll take you over to that house. No sooner had they got into the kitchen and I was conceived. So she said, so Buick may not be my father. What was the alternative story you believed <laughs> for the most of your young life? Well, you see, my father, if he was my father, Buick, was an alcoholic. And she said he could hammer on the door. I wouldn't let him in. Of course, he's not your father. So that was her explanation. She left However, him. she had many sisters. And the sister said Alice, which was her name, uh, her real name. She was nicknamed Harry. We all know very well that Alice was a dreamer. Alice was uh, mad about D.H. Lawrence. She would, much to the family's disapproval, go out and dance with the miners. Her family were sort of middle class and would have preferred her. What to part of England are we talking? Oh, Newcastle. Newcastle, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And Alice, she was married to this man called she, Buick. She married okay. then one of the mine owners Ooh. which was uh, but she still probably hankered for the the rough miners <laughs> anyway uh the next thing was uh she and her alcoholic husband my father maybe parted <laughs> okay <laughs> and uh she ran away to lechworth and she knocked on a hotel door and the woman came to the door and she said, I'll have to turn you away. The hotel's not finished. Come back, she said. Uh, the hotel, it's terrible luck if you turn away your first customer. Bad luck. You can stay. So Hazel, my sister, myself and my mother went into this unfinished hotel belonging to a Kerry woman called Pat. And Pat uh, was married to an English man called Newling. Pat said... In the, throughout the jigs and the reels, they sat on the Aga throughout the night and talked of Kerry and how she had two children who were left without parents because of galloping meningitis. Their parents had died. And my mother said, right, I'll go and foster them and bring Hazel and Pauline with me. To Kerry? To Kerry. Now, how old were you at this stage? Two and a half. Two and a half. And your Se sister? Seven. Okay. So off we go to Kerry, we're given a farm, and we have years, I think it's six or seven years, of an amazing life. That's why Holly, Poppy were brought up in Kerry, because I just like, hankered for them to have country Kerry life like I had. Next, Vorjak's Songs My Mother Taught Me. This recording by Paul Robeson from November 1938. Songs my mother taught me in the days long vanished, seldom from her. Drops burn. 
one thing that struck me as being very sad uh, was when I saw the children up to three and four years of age still in an institution that was ours and no way out for them. This is Sister Hildegard from the Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus and Mary who came from Chigwell in Essex invited by the Irish government in 1930 to set up a mother and baby home in County Tipperary to replace the old workhouse system. These were children who were born to unmarried mothers here? Yes. And they were three or four years old? Yes. And were their mothers gone? No. The that was the, the whole thing. The mother had to stay because, you see, you were getting ten and sixpence a week for them, so you couldn't pay a staff. So the mother had to stay with the baby. And that was, that was organised by the county council in every county in Ireland. And so that was their way of working. If the mother stayed with the child, and then till that child was... Then t till they decided to take that child out and board it out to a family. And they would pay the family then for looking after the baby. Sadly, until it was 16 years of age, and then it was nobody's child. Sister Hildegard had come to Shanross Abbey in 1935 and she recalled that the nuns had in some cases initiated an adoption procedure. It was a very funny thing happened. Um, a home assistance officer came into us and he was very cross. He didn't think we should have authority to do this but we had already registered as an, as an adoption society. So he didn't think we should because the people he had been giving children out to, this is very sad, the people he had been giving children out to were paid by the county council and they were very annoyed because there were no more children going out to them. Ex and there were exceptional cases where the foster parents did look after them and had a home for them if they wanted to and return. they were exceptional? They were exceptional, very exceptional. And what would happen to the others? They'd have to go and find a, a, a place to work, maybe in England or here and a lot of them were kept on on farms working but there was no such thing as to try and educate them they didn't come under that category at all they were just nobody's child that's the only way you could see it I often cried about when I think nobody's child there wasn't any person on earth that was there to lend a hand to that particular child but the mothers didn't have very much of a chance of uh, I remember um, a lady coming in here one day uh, to um, Mother Rosemond and she wanted a girl to go out to her, as she said, as a servant. And Mother Rosemond said to her, what would you be prepared to give the girl in money? And she said, oh, I don't know. What I, would she want money? So Mother Rosemond said, well, I should think she would want money. So she said, well, I suppose 10 shillings are... Oh, my goodness, she said, I get a man for that. So Mother Rosemond said to her, well, I'm afraid you'll have to get the man. Because she said, I couldn't send a girl to anything like that. She'd have to do better than that. But she was just surprised that the girl had to be paid at all. She was doing something big for her by taking the girl at all. There's a spot in my heart which no colleen may own. There's a depth in my soul Never sounded or known. There's a place in my memory, my life, that you feel no other can take it. No one ever will. Sure, I love the dear silver that shines in your hair and the brow. That's all furrowed and wrinkled with care. I kiss the dear fingers so toil worn for me. Oh, God bless you and keep you, Mother McCree. Yes, I, I, I look pretty dressed up in the picture. I have my dress and my matching slippers. Teresa O'Sullivan, who was born in the mother and baby children's home in Chum in County Galway. But the bottom line is nobody knows what way I was feeling inside. 
and I can see the scabs actually in some of the rash down along my hand there as well if you look down as well. They had pictures of the babies just to send as a commodity to America for the Americans to buy us and that's the reality. It was a hell, hell hole for them. Peter Mulryan, also born in the Chum mother and baby home. My mother was there for 12 months. She slaved in, in St. Mary's home in Chum there. She had to look after other children uh, as much as possible, kept kept away from from her son because the, the, what they said at the time, they didn't want us to bond. Love the dear silver that shines in your hair And the brow that's all furrowed and wrinkled with care I kiss the dear fingers so toil-worn for me Every county uh, looked after their own uh, girls. Sister Hildegard again. She worked all her life in the Shan Ross Abbey mother and baby home near Ross Gray in County Tipperary. From her testimony, she was always well-intentioned and she was not very impressed by the county council or sometimes by wider Irish society, including the families of these single mothers. There was a very... Uh, a very sad angle to it that it was a child of their own family but there was no return there was a gentleman brought in his daughter here one morning she was an only girl and again it was mother rosamond who met him at the door and he she was he, talking to them in the hall and he turned to the girl and he said to her opening the door you take take your last look at freedom and your last look at me because you'll never see any again so mother rosamond said to him that's a dreadful thing for you to say I mean it, he said. So she said, well, you don't have to worry, she said to the girl. We look after you. But that was an attitude of a family to an only girl. So, uh, you see, uh, they, were, they were very wronged in every single way. Uh, they were already wronged because, before they came to us. But they were doubly wronged because there wasn't a helping hand there to put them back, even if they wanted to get back. And you never, uh, you, you didn't get the type of person who was on the street or that. We never, only once... In all our way through, did we get a girl who had been on the street? Anybody else? They were very, very young and innocent, and a lot of them, I would say, were more sinned against. I would say any one of them, the hundreds wouldn't have, there wouldn't have been a sin amongst them. I think it was, it was, they were sinned against, but they were left then by the people who had used them and abused them, the whole lot of it. I know who 
This morning's programme is an anthology edition from the RTE Sound Archives of material related to and appropriate to Mother's Day. Next, from the poetry series Poems Plain, Michael Hartnett reading this poem by Carl Wotila, Pope John Paul II, who wrote his poetry before he became Pope in the 1950s and 1960s. Light piercing, gradually, everyday events. A woman's eyes, hands, used to them since childhood. Then brightness flared, too huge for simple days, and hands clasped when the words lost their space. In that little town, my son, where they knew us together, you called me mother, but no one had eyes to see the astounding events as they took place day by day. Your life became the life of the poor, in your wish to be with them to the work of your hands. I knew the light that lingered in ordinary things like a spark sheltered under the skin of our days. The light was you, it did not come from me. And I had more of you in that luminous silence than I had of you as the fruit of my body, my blood. I'm quite sentimental about, about mothers because I was my mother's pet. This is broadcaster, singer and songwriter Shay Healy on a Mother's Day interview with Marion Fanukin some years ago. And I had four sisters and a brother. And about three years ago, we were all back in Dublin for the first time in a long number of years. And we went down to the family house and we sat around and we reminisced. And uh, I felt compelled to say, look, um, while we're all here, I want you to know, <coughs> I am aware that Ma singled me out and gave me favours where she denied the rest of you and I didn't realise at the time what was going on and I didn't realise it might be hurtful so if any of you were offended I apologise now and the course went around well I wasn't offended and I wasn't offended and my eldest sister said I was offended and she stuck me to the floor on it but I was uh, very much so I was the pet yeah however you must remember that everybody's mother is a potential mother-in-law for somebody else <laughs> terrifying so I dug up I dug up uh, an old Alan Sherman record, which is very scratchy, but it, this is the most uh, apropos song we're going to hear today. Okay, okay, let's have it. It's very clear. Your mother's here to stay. <laughs> Not just a year, but ever and a day. She came to stay just for Mother's Day with the kids and you and me and that was Mother's Day of 1953 <laughs> if it appears that I've become a grouch it's all these years of sleeping on the couch <laughs> I hear Gibraltar just tumbled he just crumbled I knew they'd go someday But Your mother's here To stay I was walking, pushing my brother Alfie along in his pram And I looked over and there she was This is writer Frank McCourt Reflecting on the portrait he painted of his mother in Angela's Ashes with this crowd of beggars, and the door opened, and outside the Redemptorist Church priest's house, and uh, you know the hands would reach out to grab uh, bags or bits of food that were being given away. So I, I was so humiliated. I was, I, it was hard enough. It was worse for her, of course. But I, w I was hoping, as hungry as we were, I was hoping none of my friends would see my mother begging. First of all, my father, he thought I should be an altar boy. And he'd been an altar boy up in Toome, County Antrim. 
So he, uh, he teaches me the Latin. He has me kneeling on the floor in the kitchen, drilling the Latin. He knew all the Latin. He knew the priest, the priest uh, Latin and the altar boy Latin. So, and he drilled me and drilled me and drilled me. So then he told my mother to wash my face and comb my hair. And we, so we, we went into the sacristy at St. Joseph's Church. And uh, my father said, this is my son. I'd like him to be an altar boy. And Stephen Cleary looked at me. I was not a very prepossessing looking individual. Stephen Cleary said, we have no room for him. So I wasn't dressed properly. I didn't look respectable. The same thing happened when, eventually, when I was 12 or 13, and, and the, the headmaster at Leamy's National School said, told my mother that I was bright and I should go on to secondary school, take him up to the Christian Brothers. And my mother was very reluctant, because, but she wanted me to go on. I didn't want to go on. She had no money. I don't know how we were going to afford it, clothes, books, or anything else. So she takes me up to the Christian Brothers on Sexton Street in Limerick and a brother answered the door and she said she wanted to talk to the superior brother Murray. Brother Murray came to the door. She said, uh, this is my son. Mr. O'Halloran says he's bright. Could I, send, could I send him to the secondary school at the Christian Brothers? And he again said, we have no room for him. And he simply shut the door in her face. And that was one of those horrible moments. Worse for her than it was for me. I was delighted. I didn't want to go to the Christian Brothers. I wanted to get a job and go to the Lyric Cinema every Saturday night and eat sweets. That was my idea of heaven. But she walked through the streets of Lima and she was, she had this, her nose used to get pointy, I think, at times like this. Her nose got more pointy than ever. And she looked so angry. And I don't know how she was able to deal with all of this. These constant rejections. And she said, to, she said to me, you're never to let anybody shut the door in your face again. Next, Al Jolson, billed as the original jazz singer, with one of the most memorable songs of the 1920s. Everything seems lovely when you start to roam. The birds are singing the day that you stray. But wait until you are further away. Things won't be so lovely when you're all alone. Here's what you'll keep saying When you're far from home Mammy Mammy The sun shines east The sun shines west I know where the sun shines best Mammy my little mammy, my heart strings are tangled around Alabama. I'm a coming. Sorry that I made you wait. I'm a coming. Hope and trust that I'm not late. Oh, my little mammy I'd walk a million miles For one of your smiles My mammy oh. Mammy My little mammy The sun shines east The sun shines west I know where I know where the sun shines best this on my mammy I'm talking about Nobody else is My little mammy My heart strings are tangled around Alabama Mammy Mammy I'm coming Oh I I hope I didn't make you wait Mammy Mammy I'm coming Oh Lord I, I hope I'm not late Mammy, look at me Don't you know me I'm your little baby I'd walk a million miles For one of your smiles My Al Jolson, this was a special edition of the programme to mark Mother's Day and a postscript 
We'll leave the last word to Carmel Hayes, born in Bessborough, mother and baby home in Cork, happily adopted and keen that all the single mothers over so many decades should not be forgotten. I suppose it should be said as well that thousands of women gave birth here in Vesper. Up to, it's thought up to 10,000, certainly a minimum of 8,000. All of them, whether their babies died or whether they lived and were adopted, were lost to their mothers and the effects were the same and they suffered a tremendous loss and we think it's about time that their grief was properly acknowledged. This morning's programme for Mother's Day was based on original programmes by Miriam O'Callaghan, Gemma McCrohan, Martha McCarran, Tommy Meskell, Michael Hartnett, Marion Fnookan, Mike Murphy, Pascal Sheehy and myself. More voices from the archives at the same time on Sunday morning next. Thank you for listening this morning and good morning. That program was presented and produced by John Bowman.